All right. Well, I think it's probably safe to start. And uh, greetings to everyone who has signed on so far. Uh, my name is Fred Brown, a member of the SPJ Professional Standards and Ethics Committee. And I'll be the moderator for what I think you're going to find is a very compelling presentation. One that applies not only to war reporting, but to any situation where there's trauma and people are in peril. Uh, we encourage you to participate when you can by typing your questions in the Q&A uh, format down at the bottom, uh, where there is, uh, it's right next to the chat, which you can use for uh, other messages, but I will monitor the Q&A uh, box in particular. Um, and there will be several places where we will ask specifically for your input, but uh, don't be afraid to ask questions in that format uh, when you have them. Our presenter is Eric Wishart, who is eminently qualified to address this topic. It's a very important topic because of what's going on in Ukraine right now. Um, from 1999 until 2005, I believe Eric was editor in chief of, and pardon my French, Agence France Presse, based in Paris, the first non French editor in AFP's history. Uh, he has covered and organized coverage for conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq and really all around the world. He is currently based in Hong Kong where he is AFP's editor for standards and ethics. He also teaches international conflict reporting at Hong Kong Baptist University and news and feature writing at Hong Kong University. He, like me, is a member of SBJ's Professional Standards and Ethics Committee, and he is a former president of the Foreign Correspondence Club in Hong Kong. A native of Glasgow, he began his journalism career working for Scottish newspapers in 1972 and joined AFP in 1984. He wrote the AFP charter, which sets out the agency's guiding principles. He wrote its code of ethics, which has been published in five languages. The agency's 20 principles of, of, of reporting and uh, a major update of the AFP style book, which he ed edits. In this workshop, he will cover some of the key ethical challenges in covering conflicts, a topic especially relevant now. Some of the images you're going to see can be disturbingly graphic, just as a trigger warning, but as he will show you, the principles used in war reporting can also be applied to daily beat reporting. So I'm gonna get out of the way now, start monitoring your questions when you have them, but, uh, uh, Give Eric a chance now to introduce his self, himself and the topic. It's my great pleasure to introduce Eric Wisher. Uh, thank you, Fred. And um, so I'm delighted to be invited to do this, this talk on this very important topic. It's, um, I've got a lot of slides, video. I mean, I, I call it a workshop, I, I, you know, it's, it's designed to be practical, to give practical advice. So I don't want it to be too, it's not a lot of boring PowerPoint slides, so don't worry. But, um, you know, I, I want there to be some takeaways. I mean, I know a lot of your experienced journalists, but I think it's good to share uh, how we see it at AFP. And I think, I think one important thing is to have some basic ground rules, for example. And I think one key area is using graphic images, which I'll, I'll get to. So I think, it's, you know, if we're dealing with ethical issues, I think it's good to, to be less, to be not just operate on gut feelings. I think it's good to have some checkpoints. So that's what I want to get over. And also, I mean, I, I teach conflict reporting at Baptist University. I think a lot of my students, many of them come from mainland China, will never go to a war, but a lot of the lessons they learn can be applied to everyday reporting. So I went, that's one of the messages today as well. So if I can, I'll just start. Um, I hope you all understand the Glasgow accent. I've been away since <laughs> 1984, but I think you can 
take the man out of Glasgow, but you can't take Glasgow out of the man. So if you miss anything, <laughs> please please feel free to ask or to, to you can add me on Twitter and send me a, a direct message afterwards. So I'll share my screen. Um, okay, here we go. So, okay. So, I mean, the, the timing can, is, is sort of tragic, but the, the, the timing could hardly be better because, um, you see the screen okay, Fred? Yes, I see it. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Anybody so, having any problems, just uh, message or chat or whatever. But so I we're one month into this invasion of, of Ukraine, and um, this is a, a recent graphic, which the dark areas basically show the Russian advance. Um, and um, so I'm going to look at some issues generally. Safety, what we would call the fog of war, which is just trying to figure out what's going on. Censorship, um, use of graphic images, which, which I think is a very important topic. And also racism, which crept into the coverage of the, um, of the refugee crisis, which is, I'll finish with actually. Um, so let's start with the most important thing, safety. And, you know, it's seven o'clock in the morning here and I wakened up to this news, this, this young Russian journalist working for an independent news outlet. Actually, I think she's quite close to Navalny, who just got nine years in jail, has been, just, has just been killed in Kiev. So, I mean, if there's any reminder of, of what the dangers are on the ground, this was a, sh a shocking reminder. It's seven o'clock in the morning here and this is where I wakened up. And of course, She's the fifth journalist we know known to have died. Um, the first one was a camera operator for Ukrainian TV. He was killed very early on when the Russians shelled a TV transmission tower. As we know, Brent Renault, a very um, renowned filmmaker, was killed in Irpin. And then two Fox News journalists, a cameraman and, 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 and a local Ukrainian journalist were killed as well. So this, is, this has been deadly. This is a deadly conflict for for journalists. So what can we do about it? Um, I think one key thing is that anybody there must have undergone mandatory hostile environment training um, for all those in the field. And this is something that um, always worries me about freelancers because um, it's expensive. It can cost several thousand dollars to do a three, a four or a five day course. Uh, this is Nicole Tung, who's a Hong Kong uh, photojournalist, is based in, in Turkey, and she worked with James Foley, who, is, as you probably all know, was kidnapped and, and killed by ISIS in Syria. And the only reason she wasn't with him on that trip was because she was getting her camera fixed. So I think a very important thing is, is the obligation of news organizations towards freelancers. Um, Going back a bit, I was sent to Algeria in 1991 to cover the second round of, of, uh, of general elections, which the Islamic Salvation Front, kind of, if you think, Muslim Brotherhood kind of organization, um, it was set to win. So by the time I got my visa and arrived, the army had canceled the election, taken over the, the country and banned the, the Islamic Salvation Front. Um, and it was really tough. <laughs> I mean, they were using machine guns to shoot at demonstrators. That was, a, that was a civil war which cost hundreds of thousands of lives. That was a very tough situation. The only advice, I, I walked into that, the only advice I got for safety was when I, um, when I walked into the office the first day on the Friday and went up to the window to have a look as you do. And they said, get away from the window, there's fire shooting, you might get hit by a stray bullet. So that was a good start. So that was my one and only bit of hostile environment training. Uh, this is a photograph of the Casbah, which is a sort of labyrinth. That I don't think even the French managed to control during the war of independence. And I went in there with a, a French photographer. There had been an attack on, um, there'd been Algerian para, Paramilitaries had attacked uh, a house where Islamic Salvation Front militants were, were based and the place was just a completely pockmarked, they used RPGs and everything. We spoke to the brothers of the guys who died, then we went for a walk, we got lost and then we ran into a group of these Islamic Salvation Front guys armed 
it was very dangerous. I mean, Algeria, subsequently, they were kidnapping journalists, killing people, you know, beheading people. Um, so that is, I mean, we did it. And, and, and when you're in that situation, you do do it. People told us not to go to the Casbah, but you do do it. That's just your instinct. But I must say, that's not the way to, 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 to do it. I wouldn't send myself, with what I didn't know then, I wouldn't send myself. So hostile environment training is really critical. I had a terrible experience. This was Alyssa Schmidt. She was a German freelance who worked for us in Kurdistan, in northern Iraq, which was pretty free of Saddam Hussein's um, influence at that time. And um, she came to Nicosia. I was the Middle East English service editor from 92 to 96. And Lissy came to my, came to the office and spent five days in my office training. I trained her every day, every night. She came to my, um, my house, she had dinner with my wife and my son, and she went back on the Friday and she was assassinated um, April 1994. Um, she went out on a, on a, on a reporting mission with, a, with her driver and a car pulled alongside and they were shot by Kalashnikovs. And, and the terrible thing looking back, I mean, we talked about safety. I used to ask her how dangerous it was, but it was never, it was not any, it was just, you know, you survived, you, you lived on instinct. And I think the good thing is now that that doesn't work anymore. That's not the, the culture. So um, I'll get to James Foley in a minute. So when I was um, editor in chief of AFP post 9-11 with the war in Afghanistan, and then we had the war in Iraq, and I was responsible for the organization of the coverage of that. And I don't know if any of you ever heard the name, but Peter Mackler, he was a very prominent American journalist with the AFP. I think he was ex-UPI. He was really my right-hand person for that coverage. And with him, we instituted um, mandatory hostile environment training to go to war zones or to um, just, or, you know, natural disasters. And so that was... So if, unless you had the training, you didn't go to war anymore. And even the old kind of bears, I used to call them, the guys who'd covered umpteen wars, um, they, they, they were a bit reluctant because they thought they knew all the tricks, but actually they found that, um, that it was indispensable actually. And it, save, it saves lives. So, so, I mean, nobody should ever think of going to a war zone without hostile environment. Training and, um, and in the past two or three weeks, I know two freelance journalists, very close friends, who said they're going to Ukraine and, and they hadn't had hostile environment training. I was quite blunt with them. I said, You shouldn't go, it's too dangerous. Even with it, you can get hit by a shell. So, I mean, freelancers will go to these zones, but if you haven't had the training, you shouldn't go. Um, we had a particularly disturbing experience with poor James Foley. He was working for AFP in another news outlet when he was kidnapped in Syria in November 2012. And as we all know, he was he was murdered by ISIS a couple of years later. And, and he worked with Nicole Tung, as I said. Um, so this was really shocking. And and I'll read this out. It's a bit, it's a bit long, but um, this was what we did. This was um, in August 2013. This was in the wake of James Foley's kidnapping because we'd reduced, we'd cut back a lot, and as a lot of news organizations did, sending foreign journalists into Syria because it was dangerous. But we did continue to degree to take um, content from freelancers. And then we decided morally, ethically, we can't do it anymore. So. This was written by our former news director, Michel Leridon. Um, we've stopped sending any journalists into rebel-held parts of Syria. The situation there is out of control and far too dangerous. Foreign reporter venturing into these lawless area runs a serious risk of being kidnapped or killed, as tragically happened to James Foley, a regular AFP contributor, murdered by IS militants in August. That is also why we no longer accept work from freelance journalists who travel to places where we ourselves would not venture. It's a, Strong decision, it's a translation, a tough decision, and one that may not have been made clear enough. So I'll repeat it here. If someone travels to Syria and offers us images or information when they return, we will not use it. 
Freelancers have paid a high price in the Syrian conflict. High enough, we will not encourage people to take that kind of risk. So I think the message is, if it's too dangerous for you, it's too dangerous for anybody else. We did get pushback from freelancers. We said it's not up to AFP to tell us what to do. We're big boys and girls. We've covered wars before. Um, I mean, my answer to that is if it's too dangerous for AFP, you shouldn't be there. And, um, and we're not going to pay for a suicide mission. And I, I don't care if you get an exclusive with the leader of ISIS. We would not use that. And I think, I think that's an important point of principle. And coming out of that, the DART Centre, which is based at Columbia School Journalism School, which does fantastic work on all these issues of ethics and trauma and safety. And around that time, they drew up freelance journalist safety principles. And a lot of the media, including AFP, major media signed it. And um, I'll just run through some of the key points. Editors and news organisations should show the same concern for the welfare of local journalists and freelancers that they do for staffers. Um, journalists operating in a conflict zone or dangerous environment should have attended an industry recognised hostile environment course. So I would say if, if you get a freelance, I mean the freelance, I, I don't want to tell them, but I said if you went to Ukraine, I wouldn't, I, I, if you go to Ukraine as an AFP editor, I wouldn't use what you're going to produce because you haven't done a training exercise and you can get killed. I hope you don't, but it's too dangerous. So you've got to, you've got to apply the same rules to freelancers as you apply to yourselves. Um, now, this is a big area. You know, it's not as kind of spectacular maybe as hostile environment training is a question of insurance. Um, and this is this comes under these principles. A lot of freelancers, it, even if you can get that insurance, it's very expensive. You go to Ukraine, you get a leg blown off or, or you need to be medevaced out, who pays for it? So medical insurance is essential. And I would say if you are using a freelance in, in a zone like that, um, ask them if, even if they've done the training, do, what is their insurance status? Okay. And news organizations should not make an assignment with a freelancer in a conflict zone or dangerous environment unless the news organization is prepared to take the same responsibility for the freelancer's well-being in the event of kidnap or injury as it would a staffer. So they get hurt or injured, you got to cover the medical expenses, get them out, okay? And then you get into a situation like lost wages. And that's the link. Um, and the same rule should apply when you cover violence in the home front. I mean, how many of the reporters down on January the 6th had the kind of gear you would need in a situation like that? I mean, I, I, mean, I, mean, I know reporters were, were, were assaulted. I know they were hiding from them. Um, so if you're, say you have a situation where you have a, where you're a commissioning editor and you have a freelance in a town and there's going to be, there's going to be a, a, a protest, which is potentially violent, same rules apply as they do in Ukraine. Have you been trained? Do you know how to cover a protest? You know, um, plan your exit route, don't stand in the middle. Do you have the gear, right? What do you, uh, what do you do if you come up against barricades? I mean, You've got to, I think that's important. I mean, it works on the domestic front as it does when you're away in a foreign war. And I think, I think these are rules that we should, we should all apply both to ourselves. We shouldn't send our own journalists down and we shouldn't, um, we should make sure that freelancers know what they're doing. And I must say, quite often I'm very surprised when I watch live coverage from American protests. I find that a lot of American journalists don't always have all the gear, the helmets and, and the body armor that, that you need to, to cover it. So I think that's something that, because you don't expect things to degenerate into violence, but as we've seen, they can. So so that's, I don't know, that's, I'll just have a little break there. Fred, um, any questions from that before I, I move on? No questions yet. Um, Good. According to the Q&A, there's no open questions and I haven't seen anything in the chat either. I might suggest that at some point, if you have an opportunity to uh, put that uh, Dart Center link in the uh, chat so that okay. people can copy it. Okay, um, Okay, I can do it in a little bit, okay? Um, okay. Okay. So covering the war in Ukraine, um, now this is this is a really this is something that comes into your newsrooms, doesn't it? Using graphic images, and I mean with 
With social media, we're exposed to graphic images every day. And I mean, it can just as easily be a horrible image from a war zone as an accident or a mass shooting. I mean, we're, and I know, unfortunately, you have a lot of these shootings in the United States. So, so how do you deal with graphic images? Um, I've, I've had to deal with this a lot in AFP. I remember there was a very famous image of a, of a girl dressed in green in the middle of, surrounded by dead bodies after a bomb explosion in Afghanistan, which went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for an Afghan journalist. And, and we looked at that and the question is, what do you do with this? Do we, do we give it or not? Do we publish it or not? So, I mean, I think this is quite a good checklist and this is, this is what I, I think I included in the, in the AFP ethics is, I think it's, I think if you're looking at these images, ask yourself this, does it add important understanding to the story? Okay. Uh, and I think the, the, the classic of course, was the falling man from 9-11. And um, I think the answer for that would be yes. Um, the context of him falling, if an image of him, you know, heaven forbid, of, him, of what happened when he hit the ground, would that add to important understanding to the, of the story? I would say no, okay? Does the public have a right to know what happened? Even if it's terrible, I would say yes, the public has a right to know, had the right to know what happened there. Does it meet your duty to inform as a journalist? And I mean, I think this is the, the, the question you have is, um, should I give this photo? Uh, I mean, as my culture as a journalist is to publish, not to withhold information. Our job as journalists is to publish information, but of course in a responsible manner. So you, does it meet your duty to inform as a journalist? And I would say that, the, I mean, again, the falling man, yes, people had to know that and you had to inform people. Does it just appeal to morbid curiosity? I would say in that case, I mean, there are a lot of people who like to go into these gore sites. They like to look at horrible images. They get pleasure out of that. That's your not your job as a journalist is not to um, to cater to that market. That's that's something else. But um, where I think that's the distinction between the image of the person falling and then what happens to them afterwards. Um, this is a, this, this this whole issue of have you considered your duty of care and ability to minimise harm to the victims and their family? This is very difficult because I mean, if you look, I mean, you, you, we have a responsibility to minimise harm. We do have a duty of care, and um, the but what sometimes an image is so compelling that um, you do have to publish. I mean the the image of 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 the girl with napalm burn, burning with napalm naked girl in vietnam was one of the key images of the vietnam war which which had a major impact on how that war was perceived uh, domestically in the united states likewise eddie adams image of of, of the general shooting the prisoner in the street so um but as much as possible you should try to um Preserve the dignity of the person. If you can't do it in that image, try to find, try to, to publish an image of them when they were alive or in a normal situation. And I'm, I'm going to give a good example of that. And another question is how will it be published to your audience? I mean, there's a big difference obviously between putting a photograph on the front page of a newspaper and, and, and being able to, to publish it on a website where you can say attention graphic image um, when when Brett Renault was killed there was there was a photograph at least one photograph of him of, of circulating of him after he was shot dead and um, I clicked onto Facebook to try and find out more about what happened to him and, and there was an image there that said um, this is an image of him you know after he was shot and it's graphic and I didn't click on it you know I didn't I know what, I didn't. I didn't need to see that image. You know, it wouldn't. It wasn't going to add to my understanding of the story, and I didn't. You know, so I mean, I think that's quite different. Where if it's obviously it's on the front page of a newspaper, it's on newsstands, um, it's lying in the kitchen table. Uh, that's another question. You know, um, so so I think that's quite a good checklist. You know, to go through, and I think if you can answer these questions, then go ahead and publish the the image. Um, Eric, 
I have a question that goes back to your comment about insurance. Uh, it's from Elysia Walkman. She's asked, oh, yeah. freelancers were lobbying to have insurance covered when on assignment by commissioners, but I don't know this has become standard practice. Do you know any more about progress on that front? You know, I just can't speak for other news organizations, but I know that within AFP, I mean, for example, our, obviously, you know, you have lots of different sort of categories of, of freelancers, but, uh, you know, somebody who might work for you in a one-off situation, you know, not in a dangerous situation, but we have a lot of quite basically permanent freelance staff and we give them hostile environment training and they do get insurance. So, but I mean, it's an absolute, I mean, that's absolutely a, a, a critical thing. And I mean, yeah, if you look at the dark, if you go, I'll, I'll try to post that link. If you go into the, um, the dark site, they talk about it. And the Rory Peck Trust does, if you know them, they're based in London. They give a lot of support to freelancers as well, which is, is worth looking at. So this is, um, this is uh, Ukraine, you know, um, again, uh, you have to see the human cost of this uh, conflict. Um, did you all see this Lindsay Adario's image from um, of, of the dead mother and kids? And it was in the front page of the Times. Um, there, was a, there was mortar shelling and they were killed. I mean, the background, I mean, this was the time story. As the mortars got closer to the stream of civilians, people ran, pulling children and trying to find a safe spot, but there was nothing behind which to hide. And the family, a mother, her teenage son and a daughter who appeared to be about eight, was spotted sprawled in the ground. Soldiers rushed to help, but could do, do little for them or a man described as a family friend who'd been helping them to escape. This was when the mortar landed. So I'll just warn you, I mean, it was in the front page of the Times, but it's, it's a... It's a a very tough image. Um, you see their faces, um, which is not always the case. Um, and I would recommend you listen. There's an excellent podcast on the daily uh, where she talks about this. Um, she talks about um, taking these images. And I mean, she sent a whole series of images to the Times and she actually thought the more graphic ones might just be kept as a kind of a record. And they chose this one for the front page. But she did something which I think was, was, was very professional. And I think, again, this is, I think, a rule that you can apply to your own reporting if, if you're covering, um, um, you know, again, mass shootings, accidents, terrorist attacks. Is, 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 don't just take an image of... If, if it's a particularly powerful image, don't just take the image and walk away. Try and find out who these people were. Speak to the families. And I mean, I think Lindsay Adario, I mean, she's such a professional. She sought out, um, she sought out, I, I, think, I think it was the a godparent or a family friend. Find out who the family were. And then she went and interviewed the father and the husband. And I mean, I think this is important. This is what I was referring to, show the picture of the people as they were. They're not just, you know, dead bodies lying in the ground. And, and this is always something you should do. And, um, and she, she speaks to the, she spoke to him and this is what she said. And at the end of the interview, I just said, um, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for your loss. And I'm so sorry I was there. And I'm so sorry I took that photograph. And I'm so sorry that it has to remind you of their death for the rest of your life. And Andrew asked him, you know, if we had been able to get in touch with you in that moment, and we had been able to ask your permission, would you have given us your permission? And he said, yes, this is a war crime. And I would have given permission. And somehow that made me feel better because somehow I felt like he understood why I do this work, why I think it's important, as devastating as it is, to be present for those moments and to document them. And in fact, the image has resonated with a lot of people mm -hmm. and it's been brought up in Congress. This photo shows the result of one horrific attack by Russian soldiers on the people of Ukraine. 
been talked about around the world as proof of the fact that civilians are being targeted intentionally by the Russian military. I mean, I mean, how professional can you be? And I mean, I think for her, I think if you do that, I mean, as a, as a, I think probably psychologically, I think it gives you a bit closure, a bit of closure um, in, in your own experience of taking that image. You know, it, it answered questions and it also, you know, I mean, it, it um, I mean, if you go back to the checklist, I mean, it did add important understanding to the story, the public, it was terrible, but the, I think, and, and, and the husband and father agreed, the, the public did have a right to know her duty to inform as a journalist. Did it appeal to morbid curiosity? I don't think so, you know. I think Eric, I, I have another question for, from Brian Coleman, the chairman of the committee. What about video? Uh, often we vet through similar checklists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when it's agreed to be newsworthy, we warn the audience about the graphic images. But should there also be a standard about repeating the video over and over? How much is too much? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the, um, I mean, I know actually um, I can answer that because I was asked to write the um, ethics uh, code for AFP. I mean, we already had sort of 20 points in the style book, which were not really adapted to the social media age. I was asked to write the ethics document after the Charlie Hebdo killings, right? And um, I mean, we don't have the time today, but I actually talk about this in, in, in my class and in, my, in other um, talks about ethics. And I don't know if you remember this, there was the two, these two brothers went into the Charlie Hebdo offices in Paris, shot the place up, I think they killed a dozen or so people. They came out and they shot a policeman in the street. And there was a man at home, heard the noise, and started filming. And the sequence, I don't know how many of you have seen the sequence, they both get Kalashnikovs. He's, he's already been wounded. He's lying on the pavement. They run up, he puts his hand up, and they shoot him close range in the head. They run around and they get in their car. That's the whole sequence. So the question is, what do you do with that video? Um, and it was very interesting that you should ask that question, Dwayne, because I've actually got video clips from that. Uh, and of how it was used on the TV. Um, there was, w most people, nobody sh showed the whole thing, including what we call the point of death when they shot him, okay? Some people pixelated him on the ground um, or pixelated as they ran up and shot him. But there was one news broadcast showed it twice, right? Showed the whole sequence twice and that's wrong. There's no need. There's no need to show it twice. I mean, showing it once, okay, is bad enough. But um, there's no need to show it twice. Uh, we showed quite a heavily edited version on AFP TV. We showed them running towards him, and then we cut it basically and showed them running back. So I think the repeat showings are problematic. I um, I did a story for the Foreign Correspondents Club magazine on. Um, on um, on use of graphic images. And one of the people I spoke to was Roger Clark, who's the, the CNN bureau chief here. And um, I asked him about the, the, the hostage videos in the, in the desert and um, when they were wearing their orange jumpsuits. And he said that he used, I don't know what the rest of CNN did, but he said, from his point of view, they used one one still, I think it was a still, I don't even know if it was a video clip, to show the context so that pe people could see what actually, what the scenario was, but he said we didn't use any other ones, okay? So you just use it once. So I think repeat viewings, you don't need repeat viewings, you know? Um, pixelation is, is one of these things. I'm not a huge fan of pixelation. I mean, particularly for a still image, I think I always feel you should show it or you shouldn't. But I mean, I think in the case of the, I think in the case of the of the of the policeman, um, I think it preserved 
the person's dignity. I mean, the brother was very critical, saying, I can see and hear him being killed every day. And, you know, he keeps replaying this in his mind, but it was important that people saw what happened in the streets of Paris to a policeman with these two guys. It was also important that we also published a photograph of him. I have a good photograph of him uh, in his police uniform, smiling, because, you know, to show him as, as an individual. So, I mean, yeah, I think the basic um, um, rules apply. I mean, what do you think, Dwayne? Or, or, or can he not join? You know? <laughs> he, he can answer by by Q and A or chat. But anyway, that um, was quite a long answer, so we can discuss it. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, we yeah. discuss it at the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks. He says all good points. Okay. Right. I just want to make sure I go back into the right. Um, uh, okay, just I've got a lot of different slides on my screen, so I'm going to go back into the. Um, I thought you were very good on the answer. Um, just to interject, thanks for unmuting. And there is a situation with television itself that has uh, become much more attuned to this, mm -hmm. but uh, <clears throat> by and large, the the uh, essence of vetting these images, we are airing more conservative obviously, but there are times when I think television lags behind the principle that is established in print about the newsworthiness. And I agree with you, pixelation is um, almost as troubling because it, it, it's the moment of death. That's what we're trying to avoid is, is that graphic nature or predatory nature of, of moment of death. So thank you for that. Thanks. So working with traumatic imagery, um, again, Dart Center for Journalism. I mean, I, I don't know how we can share the, the, the links later, but I mean, can you imagine the Nicosia desk of AFP edited James Foley's videos when he sent them to the desk and then got an ISIS video of his execution? So that gives you PTSD. I mean, PTSD is not just, as we all know, an issue for people on the ground. And actually, I just... Um, I just helped trans. I, I actually translated it. it. Was done by the company doctor a couple of nights ago. Um, guidelines on editing traumatic um, imagery, and sometimes you find that the people on the ground suffer it less than, in a way, than editors. Because at least as Lindsay Adario did, I mean, what a professional she is. You know, she could interact. She could have that sort of resolution by speaking to the person. Where if you're just doing cold editing on your own in a room it can it can really i mean we always say you can't unsee it and i don't know if any of you saw the isis videos but they were absolutely horrendous you know that was the worst things i've ever seen so just as i said it's a bit of a workshop so i just want to run through um these are the dark principles for anybody who has to edit this kind of image and i think it also applies to just this constant flow of what we're seeing on the television, what we're seeing in our, in our Twitter feeds, what we're seeing in, 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 in online news about Ukraine, it's horrendous. So, so I mean, think of traumatic imagery as if it's radioactive, radiation, a toxic substance that has a dose-dependent effect. Journalists and humanitarian workers like nuclear workers, this is dark, have a job to do. At the same time, they should take sensible steps to minimize unnecessary exposure. Frequency of viewing may be more of an issue than overall volume. So think about pacing your trauma, image load, and ensuring downtime. So you got to get away from it. Uh, eliminate needless repeat exposure. And I think this is probably more for, 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 perhaps for video editors. Review your sorting and tagging procedures and how to organize digital files and folders, among other procedures, to reduce unnecessary viewing. You don't want to see this stuff any more than you have to. When verifying footage by cross-referencing images from a wide variety of sources, take written notes of, of distinctive features may help to minimize how often you need to recheck against an original image and never pass the material on to a co-worker without some warning as to what the files contain. Don't just send something over to someone and say, hey, what do you think of that? And you get some horrendous beheading video. So, you know, I mean, we've got to sort of protect ourselves and our co-workers. Uh, Eric, I have a question here from Claire Regan. President-elect of SPJ. Uh, what about uh, local 
news organizations. Any particular guidance to apply to a situation where the, your audience may know the people involved, the victims? Now, this is a very good question. Um, would the New York Times have published that photograph if that were victims of a terrorist attack in the United States? Would they publish an image of a mother and two dead kids and a friend's faces lying in a street in, in an American city? Um, I suspect not. Yeah. I mean, there is the question of proximity, obviously. I mean, you see terrible images from, from far away that you wouldn't publish locally. So um, I think that's, that's one of these moral and ethical dilemmas, you know. Uh, people will definitely publish. Um, although, I mean, we published the photograph of the policeman being shot. So, um, but I definitely think that in, 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 in local media, I think, understandably with proximity, you're going to be much less, uh, I mean, whether or not ethically it's correct that you should have double, I mean, that's a double standard there. You know, you can publish a, an image of a dead family in Ukraine, but you're not going to publish a dead image of a family, dead family in Chicago on the street. But, um, I mean, I think that's just the way it, it works. I mean, this is just the double standard. And I mean, I think it kind of also raises the, the when we get into double standards, I think that also comes up when we look at the, um, coverage of, of refugees. I'd be interested to hear what people think about that. I, I don't think there's a, a good answer to it, you know, but I mean, I think just generally people will publish images from a far off land that they wouldn't publish if it features their next door neighbor, you know. Um, the, um, I mean, if you look at images of mass shootings in the United States, whew, um, it's pretty, I think generally, at most, I think the images are pixelated, no? I remember the images from the shootings in Paris a few years ago when there was a lot of people shot and, and most of that was pixelated. We, we did publish images from the cafes with the bodies in the ground, but a lot of that was pixelated, you know? Um, possibly, no. you know? I was gonna say, Dylan Smith, I, you probably saw this message pointed out that CNN warns about that and then shows an image that is so pixelated that there's actually nothing graphic about it. Yeah, yeah. I also think that, you know, you're sitting in your sofa and it says, tension, this report contains graphic images and 10 seconds, two seconds later, you get a dead body in your screen. I mean, I mean, there was one on the BBC, they actually had film of that family and it was just horrendous and I wasn't ready for it. And I didn't really need to see it. I mean, it's one thing, I think still images and video have a different impact, you know, but um, yeah, it's quite challenging and, and it's a very good question, you know, should you have that double standard of, it's okay if I show people from a foreign land, but I'm not gonna show people from next door, you know, I mean. During, during the Columbine shooting, there was yeah. live coverage of the high school. You covered that. Going on. You and uh, what, one of the images that has stuck with me is of a, uh, a teenage boy dangling out of a window. And mm -hmm. he had already been partially paralyzed, apparently, but he, he just fell. And it was on, on live television. I thought, well, it's too bad that couldn't have been avoided. Or that yeah. somehow, maybe, maybe you need to build in a delay when you're doing live coverage on it. On a disaster. I think the shootings in Oklahoma City were broadcast live. I think I show in Fox. I don't, yeah. somebody getting shot. I don't know if it was a policeman getting shot with a shooter. Um, so yeah, it's um, not easy this, you know. So back to, you know, protecting yourself. Experiment with different ways of building some distance into how you view images. Some people will find concentrating in certain details, for instance, clothes and avoiding others, such as faces helps, which is if you were working on that image of the, of the family. Consider applying a temporary mask to distressing areas of the image. Film editors should avoid using the loop play function when trimming footage of violent attacks and point of death imagery, or use it very sparingly and develop your own workarounds. 
Reducing the size of the window or adjusting the screen's brightness or resolution can lessen the perceived impact. Try, try turning the sound off when you can is often the most affecting part. I don't know how many of you have seen beheading videos, but geez, oh, the sound is, 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 is probably worse than the image sometimes, you know. So, I mean, I think the message is don't sit in a dark room on your own editing on your iMac with your headphones on repeat viewing this stuff, you know. Um, um, I mean, that's just, you're just asking for trouble. And um, and just take screen breaks. I mean, this is obvious stuff. Look at something pleasing, walk around, stretch your see, uh, contact with nature. I think you also have to share. I think you have to vent. I think you have to discuss it, you know, don't bottle it up. All of these can help dampen the body's distress responses. In particular, avoid working with distressing images just before going to sleep. It's more likely to populate a mental space. And be careful with alcohol. It disrupts sleep and makes nightmares worse. So self-medication is, is not the best um, answer to, to these. You know? And, you know, craft your own self-care plan. I mean, it can be tempting to work twice, three times, four times as hard when working on a story with big implications. The first week of the war, you know, with the Friday night, I'd really had it. I thought, I've just been, I've been at this from six, six seven o'clock in the morning all day looking at the images. So I've been working on quite a lot of stuff and you just get burned out with it. You really need a break, you know. It's important to preserve breathing space for your outside of work. You know, don't feel guilty that there's a war on and you're actually having some downtime. I mean, you need to regenerate. Research shows that highly resilient individuals are more likely to exercise regularly, maintain outside interests and enthusiasms, and to invest time in their social connections when challenged by trauma-related stress. I better speed up, actually. Journalists who incapacitate themselves through overwork are only undermining their own mission. Um, uh, should you help or just bear witness, and this is the pho famous photograph of the vulture and, and the child, um, these were images taken by Aris Messinas, an AIP photographer of uh, migrants um, being washed up in the shore. And I think that image really um, answers the question. Um, you can do both, you know. You're not a first responder. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a blast, I mean, there's a kind of journalist, an untrained journalist go in and start trying tourniquets on people's arms and legs, but... Um, I mean, a camera in one hand and a baby fished out of the water in the other, I think, answers your question. He says, I'd like there to be many more hands here so I don't have to stop working and help so I can just do my job, but there aren't. And when I see a baby in the water about to drown, I'll just stop shooting and I'll plug it out. Some colleagues do the same thing. Some choose not to. I don't judge. It's a choice. We still live in a free country and you decide for yourself. But I have to say that I don't like it when someone needs your help and you don't help them. I mean, I wrote into the ethics of AFP that... Um, it's down to the individual, but you know, we are all human beings and if you ha can help a, 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 an innocent person, well, you can do it. I mean, it's a commitment. You pick a baby up, then what do you do with the baby? What do you do with the child? But um, it's, um, and another, Patrick Baz, who's a, a very well-known AFP photographer who's been in this situation, says some people hide behind their cameras. Some people are frightened or scared to get involved. And so they'll, they'll hide, they'll use the camera as a kind of an excuse to say, well, I'm just a witness, you know, I don't interfere. And I think, just think this was a, a great, um, I think this was a great report. I don't know how many of you saw it, but... Um, I mean, it shows it's great reporting, it was brave, and it also showed you can be compassionate as well. Before they're willing to leave their homes. These people have been under bombardment for seven straight days and are only just leaving their homes. And they're leaving them reluctantly, and they're leaving them with the knowledge that they might not be able to go back to them. And you can see many of these people are elderly, See them, people are so exhausted, they can barely walk. They're having to climb this sort of twisted metal Many of them, as you can see, are elderly. They're visibly distressed. It's just an awful, awful scene. And, and these people are the lucky ones. 
Можно вам помочь? Спасибо вам. Можно а, ребята, вам помочь? Мне очень жарко. Это плохая. Можно вам помочь? Давайте мне вот это. Давайте мне. I'm just gonna help her carry this bag a second. Excuse me, John. While we try to. Ну вот. Ничего страшного. Ничего страшного. Как вас зовут? So people are obviously incredibly affected by the situation. They're frightened. They're exhausted. They're on edge. They've got their pets. They've grabbed whatever they can. And you're right, John, you know, you asked me before about them going to the city. A lot of these people have no idea where they're going to go once they cross this bridge. They know that they're in relative safety once they do it, but they don't have any idea where they're going to go. They don't have any idea where they're going to sleep tonight. They don't have any idea when they can get all their belongings from back home. We're still hearing the steady thud of artillery in the distance. And the fear is, John, it's just going to keep getting closer. <laughs> Pretty remarkable, <laughs> I think. You know, I mean, she did it all, you know, there. So you can't help in the port. You know. This is quite, a, sorry, I'll just, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just press on if you don't mind. Um, this is quite oh, funny. Before we do that, uh, uh, Dwayne Pullman needs to get back into the meeting and I can't seem to send a message to Rod. So Rod, if you can hear this, see if you can get Dwayne back in. Thanks, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Eric. Oh. So I can go a little bit over, I'm not too long. Oh, anymore. sure, yes. Um, so this was quite funny. This is from Masato Kajimoto, who's um, he's like the, one of the world's experts in digital verification fact-checking at Hong Kong University. He's one of my colleagues. And I was asking him, what's, what's a good, you know, I said, this is the fog of war. It's very difficult. I mean, how do you figure out what's going on, you know? And... Um, and he said, he, he came up, I don't know if it was original to him, but he told me, he said, if you're, if you're talking to a source, is it a nice source? And that's the kind of thing you can remember in your head, right? Is your source authoritative? Named. I mean, let's not forget all the unnamed sources that fed all this stuff about Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction to the destruction to the New York Times that turned out to be, not, you know, there were no weapons of mass destruction. So get people on the record, you know, don't become part of a sort of great propaganda exercise for a government which is planting stories anonymously to, 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 to push their message across. Is that an independent source? Is what they're telling you? Has it been corroborated and they have, do they have evidence for what they're telling you? So, um, I mean, I think almost as bad for me as what they would generally generically call fake news, disinformation, whatever, is this terrible tendency of journalists to follow easy narratives, you know? And I can sense this sense of frustration or impatience that fed by officials that, you know, somehow this war should have lasted a week, you know? Um, and I don't know if, you know, the First World War was supposed to be over by Christmas, right? Started in August, 1914, and everybody thought it would, they would be all be home by, by, you know, December for Christmas. And of course, it went on until 1918 with what, 25 million deaths, deaths or more. So, um, so I think we're getting into this, you know, there's a definite narrative, you know, US Defense Secretary's Russian invasion of Ukraine has essentially stalled. Putin's strategy is feeding his troops into a wood chipper. And this is quite a popular narrative. I'm not a military expert. If you look at the military generals who come on CNN, they're very critical of what the Russians are doing. Uh, Vox is Russia losing. I mean, there he is again. Most of Russia's military offensives remain stalled. But I think when we're writing about Ukraine and covering it, we've got to remember this is not Operation Desert Storm. There's no Schwarzkopf. There's no Colin Powell. It's, it's not Operation Iraqi Freedom. This is a different kind of war. And I'll just show you some images, okay? These come from, these come from Ukraine. This is Grozny in Chechnya in 1994, okay? So, you know, wars with Russia and these countries, it's tough. There's a lot of shelling, a lot of destruction, and it doesn't all finish within three weeks, okay? Um, so let's, 
you know, just I think if you're speaking to analysts who say the Russians are bogged down, I mean, it's taking time, but I think I think you also have to speak to other analysts who, who know the way the Russians operate and say, well, remember Grozny, they just relentlessly destroyed it. Look at how they helped the Syrian government in um, in Syria, you know. So, you know, the first victim of war is the truth. I mean, that's just the even before the war starts, you know, the lies start flying. Um, a lot of the images, a lot of the fake images that we saw early on were just recycled images from other conflicts. Uh, this is quite common. I mean, we are full time in this. I mean, just, just to let you know, AFP, we got this huge, big um, fact checking network. We, we have 130 dedicated fact checkers. We work in 24 languages. So I asked them and, and you know, I spoke to the head of the, that service and they said there's a lot of narratives. The, there's a lot of circulating about the Ukrainians being Nazis, having a Nazi past. This, this is circulated and some gets traction in some circles. So um, there's a lot of stuff about Putin's mental health circulates. Uh, this was one of the very early misrepresented image on social media, child wounded during Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, you know, this was February the 24th, a month ago, one of the most heartbreaking images from the Russian-Ukraine war, Putin must end this for humanity's sake. I don't know why people do this, because this poor kid was in Syria, you know. So this is, this is, but this is very easily dealt with by people who deal with digital verification. Um, there's, if we're talking about double standards, I mean, we look at Russia, Russia cracks down in dissenting media, blocks Facebook, there's an AP story. Um, Russia blocked Facebook and Twitter. Vladimir Putin signed into law a bill that criminalizes the intentional spreading of what he calls fake news, which is if you call it an invasion and not a special military operation. Uh, they blocked the BBC, Voice of America, Radio for Europe, Deutsche Welle. The, a, a Latvian website, CNN and CBS News stopped broadcasting at least temporarily. Bloomberg and the BBC, same. We kept working. I mean, you know, if you, I think in the big news organization like AFP, I mean, we have an office in Pyongyang uh, where we worked in Baghdad under Saddam Hussein. I mean, I think, you know, I think you, you have to, uh, I agree that you, if, if your staff are under threat of, of arrest, you've got to get out. But I think the best thing you can do is try to stay and work in the in the new reality, the new environment. Um, but at the same time, while we were criticizing the Russians for doing this, the European Union banned RT, which I was watching in Hong Kong actually as a as a source to see what the Russians were saying about the, the war. And the European Commission president just came out and said, we'll no longer be able to spread their lies to justify Putin's war. Uh, and this gives you now a sense of what RT was was doing. Moving to the newly recognised Donbass republics, where intense fighting with Ukrainian forces continues along the front line. Local authorities in both the Lugansk and Donetsk republics claim that several towns were targeted in overnight artillery attacks. Ukrainian military units and nationalist militia groups in the region have allegedly intensified shelling as they prepared to treat, retreat westward. A massive fire has erupted at a fuel depot in the Lugansk People's Republic. Local authorities claim a Ukrainian missile attack caused a blast with at least 200 tons of fuel having caught on fire. Several people have been reported injured, but the numbers are so far unclear. Roman Kosarev is in Donbass. So, I mean, as far as I know, I think the UK just revoked its license and, and, and RT has shut down in, in the United States. So... I'd be very interested to hear what people think about that, actually. <laughs> Is it a good thing to have to have banned RT? If, if you have questions, type them into the Q&A. Um, yeah, any, any comments on that? Um, you know, again, it seems like a double standard. There was no outcry, there was no criticism that I could see. There was very limited criticism of the, of the ban of RT and Sputnik in the West, you know? where there was a, there's inevitably criticism of, 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 of um, Putin's crackdown in the media and his, 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 you know, his, his fake news law. So, I mean, I mean to me, RT, you can't get RT in, in Hong Kong anymore, I think, because we get, I think the, the package they get is from, I think it's from Sky TV in, 
or Sky News in, the, in, in Europe or in the UK, you know. But to me, that just deprived me of a, I want to see what the Russians are saying, you know. I mean, I think that's, um, and I think people are adult enough to decide that it's, it's what it, it is, what it is, you know. So, I mean, I, I find that, um, you know, how can we criticize the Russians for banning Western media when we ban their media? And of course, living in China, as I do, then that just feeds into the, they say it's just hypocrisy because, you know, there's a lot of criticism in, in the West of the way Chinese handle media. They, they expel, occasionally they'll expel journalists from China and they'll say, well, you know, you criticize us for doing this and then you ban RT, you know? Yeah. I know a number of liberals who make a point of watching Fox News right. so that they can see what the other side is up to. Yeah, yeah. So uh, okay. Here's a question or a comment from mm -hmm. Elysia Volkman again. Uh, let me get it on the screen. I, I don't agree with banning it. Let people decide. They're terrible, but it plays into not just Russian propaganda and the Arabic region see it as Western imperialism, so they buy into the Russian narrative. So it's counter. So it's counterproductive then. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the second you ban something, people want to see it, right? Yes. Just tell James. Just ask James Joyce and Ulysses. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best publicity for that book, you know. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I won't be too much longer. Okay. So, I mean, what do you do? I mean, how do you get any idea of what's going on? So I would say your best source is your reporters on the ground. I mean, that great report from Clarissa Ward, obviously. I mean, at least she saw what was happening. I mean, you know, these were not crisis actors, okay? So um, reports from established media with a track record of war reporting. You know, if you get stuff from AP, I mean, they did fantastic work in um, Mariupol. Yeah, P writers or the established media, sure, as long as they're not pushing a narrative. Uh, regard all reports from interested parties as potential propaganda. And I think an interesting thing I haven't, I didn't get into slides on that, is the use of prisoners of war. Um, I actually just wrote, wrote guidelines, I don't know, I didn't share it with the SPJ, on coverage of prisoners of war. A lot of people say you shouldn't report on prisoners of war when they're paraded before the cameras. Um, I actually spoke to the ICRC in Geneva about this. They're very, if you ever have to deal with them, they're very, they're very responsive. And it was the same question that came up in 2003 with the American prisoners of war in Iraq. The ICRC's position is that they can't be exposed and it's under the Geneva Conventions, prisoners of war, I mean, apart from being tortured and killed, obviously, shouldn't be, ex shouldn't be exposed to humiliating or degrading treatment of what they call public curiosity, you know, which is the gray area for media coverage. But on the other hand, they say that it can be positive because it is proof of life, you know. So if you do parade, if you do produce prisoners of war, it means they're alive, people can see they're alive. It makes it more difficult to kill them afterwards, to be honest. And, um, but I think the important thing is, is how you cover it. I mean, the way we covered the, the press conference, there was about seven or eight of them, was we gave a very distant, Sort of just of them all sitting at the table. And we said that the Ukrainian authorities paraded Russian prisoners of war in front of the cameras. And then we said, speaking under duress, some of them were wounded, they said, yes, we were tricked into going to, to Russia, whatever. And, and we couched it in these terms. And then we wrote about the Gina conventions and everything. But I'm not going to name the media, but some media in, in Britain, the headline was Russian soldiers say they were tricked into fighting in Russia, okay, and that Putin is a terrible guy and all the rest of it. I mean, that is, you're serving a propaganda purpose there. I mean, if you're not putting the context, if you're taking what prisoners of war speaking under duress are saying as fact, as gospel, and leading on that, you're, you're serving the propaganda purposes of, 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 of one of the combatants, which is Ukraine. I mean, it's quite possibly it's true. I mean, there's a lot of stories about the Russians didn't know what they were getting involved in these young soldiers, but still. So I think, you know, if it ever comes up in your newsrooms, yes, you can quote prisoners of war, but they can't be humiliated, degraded, okay? 
and just avoid confirmation bias to fit a narrative. You know, the her heroic Ukrainians, the failing Russians, it's the fog of war, okay? Um, I mean, um, you know, it's a very emotional thing. I mean, what's happening is absolutely horrendous, but we gotta, we still gotta remain true to our sort of journalistic principles. And we had a very interesting discussion at the last ethics committee meeting about objectivity, right, Fred? It's, yes. It's different, you know? I mean, yes, I, don't believe in, I don't believe in false balance or false equivalence either, you know, you know. Um, was there a question pop up there? I've just got one more sort of talking point to come. Right, racism. Okay, here we go. So I'll just finish with this. It's a bit dry. It's a bit dry here. This is for refugees, okay? And I find this quite striking. Um, so here we go. Um, okay. So the migrant crisis of 2015, um, you know, after 9-11, we had the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and then called, led to what they called the Arab Spring, which when you actually saw what happened was a bit of a misnomer, you know, and violent uprising in Syria, Libya, and Egypt. Um, and it led to what they called the migrant crisis that peaked in 2015. Um, this was the coverage from the British press. This was Katie Hopkins. Rescue boats had used gunshot, gunships to stop migrants. Um, Britain must ban migrants. Okay. The swarm in our streets, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, called them a swarm. Um, and then, of course, you see these four images, you know, you know, Arab looking people, a black man, I mean, playing into people's prejudices. Okay. Um, Good evening. It's rare that we have to warn you right from the top of the newscast about what you're about to see, but the photo we're going to show you has quickly resonated across the world as a heartbreaking symbol of an utter human catastrophe that we can't close our eyes to. It is the image of a lifeless child in the arms of a rescuer on a Turkish beach, one of the thousands of migrants and refugees from the war-torn Middle East and Africa who have perished in a desperate attempt to find a new life in Europe. But even for those who survive, a rude awakening awaits in countries that are moving to close their doors. NBC's Kelly Kobiea has the story. It's been days. Desperate families stranded outside a train station in Budapest. No answers, no help, nowhere to go. Imagine yourself in our place. You are a human. We are a human. You have kids. We have kids. Hundreds are stuck here. The Hungarian government refusing to let them board trains out of the country. Shireen Mamo walked here with her children. Her brother made it to Germany. She's now alone, feeling helpless and hopeless. Europe is a continent in crisis. A warning, this disturbing image shows how bad it has become. The body of one small boy cradled in a Turkish police officer's arms. He was from Kobani in Syria. His boat sank last night on the way to Greece. And the Mediterranean keeps claiming lives, with 17 more bodies appearing on Libya's shores. More than 100 feared dead in that sinking. These are the fortunate ones, saved by the Norwegian Coast Guard today. On dry land, Austrian police stopped this truck on the way to Vienna, freeing 24 teenagers welded in with no air. And in France, the high-speed train from Paris to London ground to a halt after migrants tried to climb on top. Here in London, hundreds of passengers were left stranded as the morning trains were canceled, while on the other side of the English Channel, two trains had to turn back because the tracks were blocked. Some passengers even asked to listen for footsteps on the roof of the train. Tonight, the leaders of Germany, Italy and France are calling on all 28 EU nations to take in their, quote, fair share of refugees. We just need the politicians to listen to their hearts, you know, act like human beings. While European leaders argue over what to do, hundreds in Hungary are spending another cold night on the concrete in limbo. Kelly Kobiea, NBC News. So I think we have more than 3 million refugees have now fled uh, Ukraine. I mean, one interesting thing, and I wrote guidelines again, just updated them for the AFP, is 
the difference between refugees and asylum seekers. And one thing that's been striking is that, I mean, I think all, basically all, um, at least all of the Ukrainians who have gone into Europe have immediately been recognized as refugees. I think a lot of the people who fled in 2015 from conflicts in North Africa in the Middle East became asylum seekers because there was a lot of um, suspicion in, in, in the European Union that they were actually economic migrants. So, um, you know, if you're, if, 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 if you're immediately recognized, um, and I, I spoke to, I know Chris Boyne, who's the, the UNHCR spokesman in Washington, and he said that you can be, you know, in a situation like Ukraine where it's obvious what is happening, um, you can the, the the host country can instantly recognise you as a refugee, and then a whole lot of you know um, things kick in. You know, the residency and social benefits. Where if you're an asylum seeker, it's different. And so the the refugees from Ukraine have been immediately recognised as refugees, where a lot of the migrants from North Africa and the Middle East became asylum seekers and had to enter this tortuous procedure of, of trying to prove that you're fleeing that you're you're fleeing. Um, harm and, and, and that you risk persecution if you go home. So um, so the, the, the whole language about the refugees, when you compare the British, the appalling British coverage of the migrants in general and, 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 and the situation for these people in 2015, I mean, and then you get this kind of language. These, these are Ukrainian refugees marching in it's changed uh, the calculus entirely uh, tens of thousands of people have tried to uh, flee the city there will be many more people are hiding out in bomb shelters but this isn't a place with all due respect um, you know like Iraq or Afghanistan that has seen conflict raging for decades you know this is a relatively civilized uh, relatively European, I have to choose those words carefully too, a uh, city where you wouldn't expect that or hope that it's going to happen. Now the unthinkable has happened to them. And this is not a developing third world nation. This is Europe. talking to us Matthew we're playing in the latest pictures of some of the refugees trying to get on trains or trying to get out of Ukraine and, and what's compelling is just looking at them the way they're dressed these are prosperous I'm looking to use the expression these are prosperous middle class people these are not obviously refugees trying to get away from areas in the Middle East that are still in a big state of war these are not people trying to get away from areas in North Africa they look like any European family that you would live next door to. These are not refugees from Syria. These are refugees from uh, neighboring Ukraine. I mean, that, is, quite frankly, is part of it. These are um, Christians, they're white. It's really emotional for me because I see European people with blue eyes and blonde hair being killed, children being killed every day with Putin's missiles. You know, one of my best friends is from Afghanistan and um, he, you know, he has the same hopes and aspirations as I do and everybody else does. I mean, it's just... Um, you know, because you I mean, I was very struck by that. I don't know what your feelings about it was. And and it's also so wrong. I mean, Ukraine is the poorest country in Europe. I mean, I mean, it's, and it's just, um, and it's just historically, I mean, Ukraine is, I mean, Europe, two world wars started in Europe. I mean, the Holocaust was in Europe, the Balkans, the, the, um, the, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, I mean, the Donbass, Eastern Ukraine, there's been conflict there since 2014. So, I mean, to try and say that Europe is some peaceful place and, and how can this be happening to people that look like us? I mean, it, it just shows this complete contrast between the coverage of, of that and the coverage of the migrant crisis in, 
in 2015 and, and it's just um uh, i was pretty stunned by it you know <laughs> so i don't know i can sum up maybe or i don't know if anybody wants to if anybody had a comment about that um hey, fred should i just do my little sum up here and finish up i don't see any questions right now uh there is a, yeah. a, a chat a comment in the chat which i think is a very good one Oh, uh, it's, it's ironic that people who've been on the planet so much longer than the the, the, the people who are, are trying to turn them into the other uh, yeah. are are characterized in this way. Yeah. Um, anyone you else? At the, Fred, the, what did you think of that, Fred? What did you think of that? Of the, you know, I think they were they were embarrassed to say it, but it sometimes it just doesn't help. Sometimes it's better just to not say it. I mean, there is, I mean, use is proximity and obviously maybe people can relate to people who look like themselves, but th there's a way of saying that. But I mean, to, to kind of say that this shouldn't happen to white Christian people, it's, but if you're an Arab or a Muslim, yeah. well, you, that's, you know, you come from a country like that, that's what you expect. I mean, no, I mean, I work for the I, I think they were trying to say that, you know, that people will identify with them because they are like them. But uh, you have to be, as one of them acknowledged, you know, it's, you have to be very careful about what you say. And sometimes maybe it's better just not to say it. And, you know, as I say, I mean, Europe, I mean, the Holocaust. <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, it was... I mean, the Holocaust was 10 years before I was born. I mean, this is not ancient history. So, I mean, before you start talking about Europe and, and, and people with blue eyes and fair hair, I mean, maybe, maybe bone up in your recent European history, you know. So anyway, just to sum up, I, I know it was a bit long, but there was quite a lot of things to get through. It was excellent, Eric. Thank you. So I'd just like to thank you. I'd just like to, so safety is the most important thing in war coverage and that terrible, tragic story this morning with the young Russian journalist as a reminder. The truth is the first victim, even before the guns start firing. That's an old cliche, but it's true. Censorship and propaganda are integral to war. I don't think, though, that journalists should accept censorship and propaganda. I don't think that I, I want to see what RT is saying, just as I wanted to see what the Iraqis were saying during the war in Iraq. Graphic images tell the story, but need to be justified and handled with care. We have a duty of care to the victims, and we also have to look after our own mental health, both with the people on the ground and um, and those um, handling it. And journalists must guard against racial and ethnic stereotypes in the reporting, which, I mean, unfortunately, these, these, these um, probably, you know, live on air, people do say things that they regret afterwards, but still it didn't. You got to think before you open your mouth in these situations. And, and, and um, so, I mean, I think that's, that, that kind of sums up what you wanted to say. Well, once again, thank you very much. I think this has been an excellent presentation. And, and thanks to those of you who participated and uh, had, some great comments and, and great questions. This has been kind of a precursor to SPJ's Ethics Week, which uh, will offer several programs during the first full week of April. So please uh, remember to come back then and uh, we'll have some more uh, uh, good guidance for all of you journalists out there. And for those of you who aren't journalists, maybe you can learn something too. So. Good night to everyone, and thanks Thank again. You, Thank you. Where can people access the recording? Um, oh, yes. Uh, Rod, could you uh, sign on and, and tell us about that? Uh, Rod says we will email a link to all attendees. Yeah. And, and maybe... Also, we and with, when you send the link, I can send the, the links to the Dart Center. That's a, that's, that'd be a good way to handle that. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. okay, well, so long, everyone. Good night, and well, it's a new Whatever. day. Whatever. <laughs> In your case, good morning. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.
Okay, I see there's still a, a couple left, but. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. You're still recording, Fred. Okay, why don't we stop the recording? Yeah. I got it.